uh, some tests that we can do on orbit later this week before, you know, we, we discard the service module, so we have a pretty limited window if there's anything we want, we want to do uh, before that happens. So, um, like I said, not sure on root cause yet, but that's kind of how, it, at a high level, that's how I hope that helped. Yeah, and, and Bill, one, one more point here. Um, you know, in your, in your house, a uh, light switch or a circuit breaker, that is the command device. You, you literally um, flip the switch and it closes the circuit and that is the, the action or the command that does it. Um, what is a little bit odd to us is there's no record of, the, of a controller on board the vehicle sending a command to open the latching current limiter. So in your house, the device is the, is the command um, uh, object. In this case, there's a separate controller that tells the current limiter to open or close. Um, and there's no record of, of, the, of the command device saying you should open or you should close. This thing is just open or closing without this box, the command device telling it to do so. So there's, there's some anomalous behavior here that we're trying to understand. Our next question comes from Gina Sensuri with ABC News. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you just run through the numbers for me? Uh, speed on reentry, camps, all of that stuff. Give me those numbers if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure, Gene, no, no problem. So uh, when we come into entry interface, uh, we're at an altitude of 400,000 feet, and we're traveling approximately 24,529 miles per hour. Uh, once we get to uh, skip apogee, which is about seven minutes, uh, seven minutes, 19 uh, seconds after entry interface, we're at an altitude of uh, 2,900 uh, or 2,091, 291,382 uh, feet, and we're traveling at 16,824 miles per hour uh, at 150,000 feet. Uh, we're traveling approximately uh, 8,547 miles per hour. At uh, 100,000 feet, we're traveling uh, 2,398 miles per hour. At 50,000 feet, we're traveling 528 miles per hour. And when we jettison the, uh, the Ford Bay cover at approximately 22,845 feet, we're traveling uh, 200. 85 miles per hour, and then our main shirt shoot deploy is, a, is approximately uh, 5,320 feet, and that's uh, we're traveling 128 miles per hour. Then we uh, hit splashdown approximately 20 miles per hour. And, and just to add a point here, um, Judd, I think you said 16.8 is the skip apogee velocity. 16.8 is just shy of what a vehicle, a spacecraft, comes back from low Earth orbit at. So um, this, that's our second dip into the Earth's atmosphere is about what a, uh, a low Earth orbit vehicle would come back at it, which is 17,500 miles an hour. Our next question is from Brett Tingley with space.com. Hi, this question I guess is for Melissa Jones. Um, it was mentioned earlier in this conference that uh, there's still a pre-planned decision gate ahead that will um, help select the landing site. I'm wondering, uh, by what metrics or what criteria are the different landing sites selected? So that's actually something that Jed Freeland and myself work on together, and it's um, mostly based on weather from my perspective, and there's, I'm sure, many other factors from the flight side. Jed, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Sure, Melissa. So we have a designated primary site that we try to land at first and that's called San Diego Site 3. That's within uh, the Fleet of Hot area, which is the fleet training area, hot as in hot munitions. Uh, so that is uh, controlled by the Navy. So that's our, our first uh, target that we try to try to, uh, to land at, uh, assuming that the, uh, the weather and uh, criteria is all favorable, not only for the, the hardware of the capsule, but also uh, for Melissa's team uh, to recover the capsule once, uh, once it's in the water. Uh, and then we have various other sites within, as I mentioned, that northern weather and alternate that we could potentially go to uh, within the San Diego area uh, if, the, if the weather happens to be better uh, than our San Diego Site 3. And then if none of those sites uh, look good to us, then we can always uh, go further uprange along that track, uh, that uh, kind of south to north track that I showed you in my, my previous chart, uh, anywhere 
Right, there, there, that's the one. Uh, so, so you've got a short distance there that's uh, around 1,200 nautical miles that, that we would still uh, be able to get our skip entry uh, objective for the, for the flight. Uh, and, and then uh, the only reason we'd go any further uprange of that is uh, if we had uh, something uh, wrong with, uh, with our navigation system. Uh, we had inertial measurement units. If we had uh, more than two or two or more down, then we'd, we'd, uh, we'd either do a ballistic or a direct entry. So uh, all that to say, we look at the best weather along that track, and we find the best weather. Uh, if that best, best weather happens to be uh, San Diego Site 3, we'll go there, and, and otherwise we'll, we'll find a better place to land. Um, within those criteria. And maybe expand on the weather just a little bit. It's, it's wind speeds, but it's also wave height, wave period, um, because as we hit the water, how we, you know, how the capsule actually impacts that wave, what, where its height is, what and you're on the back side of the wave, the front side of the wave, how the winds all respond. So it's a pretty complex set of, of uh, parameters that we look at to say that you need to stay within this wave height, this wave period, this wind speed. So that's, that's how all that plays into where we finally select um, where to come down. We do have another question, this time from Alan Boyle with GeekWire. Thank you. I, I guess this question would be for Debbie. It's about Callisto. Can you say anything more about the performance of Callisto? And uh, is this something that you've decided uh, could be used on Artemis II, or do you have to wait to see uh, what the performance is and what the objectives are for that kind of communication system? Yeah, so first of all, in performance, um, so far it's been really great. I've got to witness several of the, the sessions. Um, very, very interactive, you know, very engaging um, in terms of being able to talk to the spacecraft, you know, turn lights on and off, write notes, uh, play music, ask questions. It's just, it's a really a very good engagement um, opportunity and I think um, it has some potential on how we would use that further as a digital assistant or some other onboard activity. There isn't any um, specific plans for Artemis II yet. We're waiting to get back the data from this flight to see, you know, what how it worked and, and what we can learn from how it performed. But but so far, um, the performance has been really, really nice. Our next question comes from Jim McDade with 1819 News. Congratulations on uh, so breaking so many records on this mission. It's been spectacular. First of all, uh, yeah, I'm Jim McDade, uh, 1819 News and Verity Space News Clearinghouse. Um, <clears throat> Apollo 13 uh, set the reentry speed record back in 1970 after it got on its free return trajectory. And uh, I'm given to understand that that will be one of the last, if not the last, records that this Orion, uh, that this Artemis 1 mission and Orion uh, will break. Uh, will future reentry velocities be comparable, or is it possible there will be even faster? Or, or is this another example of you pushing everything to the limits in, in this uh, shakedown cruise? Uh, let's see. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one. Uh, my expectation is that uh, the, the future missions for Artemis will be similar speeds uh, to what we're entering here, uh, uh, if not less. Uh, it, it's all going to depend on uh, the specific trajectory that we, we fly, and of course those are, are still being uh, developed for, for individual missions, but, but my expectation is that they will uh, likely no be, be no larger than the speeds that we're entering uh, for Artemis 1. Yeah, I think we definitely have some limitations or, or requirements on our heat shield, and so when we look at the reentry, part of the skip reentry is getting us slow enough down um, so that the heat um, gets down. So I think when we look to futures, I, I know we're trying to expand the skip distance um, for future missions, um, but I don't think it's going to affect the speed much. Our next question comes from Sophie Sanchez with Cosmic Chicago. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is for Debbie. You mentioned a couple of system configurations set for Artemis II that you've already tested. Um, I was wondering if there were any um, that you were planning for the duration of the mission on the return home, um, any systems that you were planning on testing for at the Artemis II settings. Thank you. Uh, 
I don't know specifically if we're testing Artemis II settings on the way home, but there's a lot of things that we are testing so we can expand the operating box that Artemis II can operate in. So things I mentioned like the, the solar array mod, uh, modal survey, uh, understanding how the, the solar arrays degrade over time, um, these, these uh, pressure control assembly within our prop system, leak checks, you know, how do valves uh, behave over time. Um, this OMZ, we're, we're orienting to tail to sun directly to see how we can get more performance out of the engine. Um, there are some mixed string uh, RCS firings we're going to be doing on the way home. Um, so there, there's a lot of objectives, not specifically putting things in Artemis II configuration, but driving the system beyond maybe where we thought we were going to operate for Artemis I so we can expand that box. And, and Debbie, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, you know, this is really the start of a campaign of, of several missions uh, to, to, to get uh, humans back to the moon and beyond to Mars. Uh, for Artemis, Artemis II, there, there's still a lot of things still to test for Artemis II. Uh, we don't have a life support system on Artemis I, and so that's going to be the major objective for Artemis II is to test that life support system. Uh, we'll also be testing um, rendezvous prox, uh, prox uh, operations, in other words, uh, rendezvousing with another vehicle when we're, we uh, we're rendezvous with the, the, uh, the interim uh, uh, cryogenic propulsion stage on Artemis II. So, so there's still a lot to be done, and, and this is just the beginning. Yeah, and Sophie, I'll just give you two more uh, as part of a preview for um, entry, descent, and landing day that we're planning for here on Artemis One, and, and I think both these happen on Judd's watch operationally. Uh, one is an aerothermal um, test during um, the uh, entry, descent, and landing where we fire, deliberately fire all of the uh, reaction control system thrusters in, in, in various um, um, points during the reentry profile to gather, gather um, um, hypersonic um, aerothermal data as we fire those thrusters. And then post splashdown, we're deliberately going to keep the vehicle powered, um, assuming the vehicle is healthy, for two hours after splashdown to understand how much heat has soaked back after, after that peak heating of up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit outside the, um, outside the vehicle. Um, the, as the heat shield protects the vehicle, there's still going to be uh, heat that soaks into the structure that is the Orion capsule. Uh, it'll splash down in the ocean. The ocean's going to cool the vehicle, but some of that heat is going to be resident in the structure of the vehicle. So we want to understand how hot the cabin's going to get. So we'll leave the vehicle powered for two hours, keep it on the cooling system for two hours to understand for astronauts on the very next mission. Um, what the temperature profile in the cabin is going to look like. So um, that's part of that six-hour um, uh, recovery time frame that, that Melissa highlighted earlier. We're deliberately going to wait um, for two hours with the vehicle powered on the surface of the ocean. So those are some of the things that are ahead of us as well. And that was the final question that we received this evening. So thanks to all who submitted questions as well as our briefers for joining us in a busy time. Next up, we continue to look forward to Orion's return home. We'll have another briefing this Thursday at 4 p.m. Central, where we'll go over that return in a little bit more depth. And we'll also be covering Orion's entry, descent, and splashdown beginning at 10 a.m. Central on Sunday, December 11th. But until then, be sure to follow along with our daily blog posts as Orion continues its journey home at blogs.nasa.gov Artemis. Thanks again for joining us, that will wrap up today's briefing.